You are listening to The Evidence Locker. Our cases have been researched using open source and archive materials. It deals with true crimes and real people. Some parts are graphic in nature, and listener discretion is advised. Each episode is produced with the utmost respect to the victims, their families, and loved ones. Warning. This episode has reference to an incident of animal cruelty that may not be suitable for all listeners. It was a crisp fall afternoon on Tuesday, November 24th, 1998, in the southern Finnish town of Huvinka. A man dumping his trash at the Capula landfill noticed something in the mountain of garbage that had just come in. At first, it looked like a part of a mannequin, but on closer inspection, he realized that it was a severed human leg. Within the hour, police as well as a medical pathologist arrived at the scene. Soon, they concluded that the person's left leg must have been discarded after a violent murder, being that it was laying within the peak of the snow-capped refuse. The pathologist studied the leg and found that it was cut off at the thigh. Furthermore, the cut was made by an instrument that was not typically used in the medical profession. It was uneven. Hacked. The initial estimation was that the limb had belonged to a man, based on the leg hair alone. However, They could not exclude the possibility that it was a woman's either. The best estimation was that the victim was between 20 and 60 years old and that he was most likely a man. Police did not think that the killer disposed of the leg at the landfill. Chances were that the body part had ended up in the dump after being discarded in the trash, somewhere in a regional network serving over a million people. The search of the landfill continued in the icy conditions for more than a month. As details of the case unfolded in the investigation, police realized that they were dealing with one of the most brutal incidents of bloodshed in all of Finland's history. Huvinka is a small southern town in Finland, about 50 kilometers north of Helsinki. 46,000 people call the city home. It has good railway connections to the surrounding area, and many residents are happy to take the one-hour train ride to Helsinki for work while enjoying the space and peace of a hometown in the country. If you arrived at the quaint historic railway station in the heart of this green city in the 1990s, you'd have thought the place to be a sleepy country town where nothing much ever took place. But beneath the surface of the tidy, well-planned streets, there were some social problems. The biggest one at the time? Probably being youth alcohol abuse. There was not a lot of violent crime in Huvinka, so finding a severed leg at a landfill wasn't something police had dealt with before. The nature of the discovery made the case a murder inquiry from the start. Police worked their way through all trash taken to the landfill on Monday, November 23rd, as well as Tuesday, the 24th. Searchers were looking for the rest of the victim's remains in addition to any clue as to who killed him. A tractor spread out the trash, and officers picked through it by hand, one bucket load at a time, for weeks. It was a massive undertaking, and students from the police college were asked to assist. Officers had to search by hand, and cadaver dogs were also employed to assist. Men from a nearby military garrison also offered their help to guard the site in the hours of the night just to make sure that no one tampered with any possible evidence. In the end, they worked their way through more than 400 truckloads before suspending the search just before Christmas. We'll take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. There is a good reason why everyone is talking about the puzzle game Best Fiends. It's never-ending fun. And it just keeps getting better. At the moment, I'm busy defeating a boss slug, clearing some blobs, and chasing a bomb at level 200. Whenever I have a couple minutes in between Evidence Locker episodes, you'll find me on my phone playing Best Fiends. You don't need the internet to play on your phone or tablet, so you don't have to worry about Wi-Fi access or cell data. It's perfect for killing time while you're waiting for an appointment. I downloaded the Best Fiends app from Apple App Store for free. It's also available in Google Play. 
Best Fiends updates the game monthly with new levels and events, so it never gets old. Engage your brain with fun puzzles and collect tons of cute characters. Trust me, with over 100 million downloads, this 5-star rated mobile puzzle game is a must-play. Download Best Fiends free on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Now, back to today's episode. A forensic examination concluded that the leg had been cut off two to three days before it was discovered, sometime over the weekend. A piece of metal wedged in the leg made the pathologist wonder if the body had been dismembered in a workshop. Searchers found a piece of metal in the mountain of trash that closely resembled the metal lathe found in the flesh of the leg. However, testing revealed that the two pieces were unrelated. It must have attached to the leg in the trash. With no more clues as to the identity of the victim, the police appealed to the public for help. Their only information was that someone, aged 20 to 60, approximately 170 centimeters tall, had been murdered. Police asked that if anyone knew someone who had gone missing recently to inform law enforcement. In 1993, the severed foot of a man was discovered in Helsinki, and investigators could not ignore the possibility that the cases were related somehow. It was more than five years before the leg was found in Huvinka, and the previous case had been linked to a convicted serial killer. The evidence had no other similarities other than it being severed and dumped. It took a whole week for searchers to find another piece of evidence linked to the crime, a small part of human tissue believed to be a piece of liver. However, it turned out to be a section of the victim's stomach. Tiny as it was, it was very significant in identifying the victim a 20- to 30-year-old male. He had a high alcohol content in his body, indicating he was heavily intoxicated at the time of his death. Wear on the tissue also meant that he was a heavy drinker during his lifetime. The person most likely came from a financially strapped situation and was assumed to have been living off welfare. This was a significant lead to follow up on because investigators could study welfare records and see if there was someone who failed to claim their welfare check. This strategy led investigators to an address in Yarvinpa, about a half-hour's drive south of Huvinka. DNA confirmed that the victim was a 23-year-old man who lived by himself. He was somewhat of a recluse who did not go out much, which would explain why no one ever noticed that he had gone missing in the days after his murder. Finnish authorities have never made his identity public, so he will be referred to as the victim throughout this episode. Investigators tried to establish where the victim was over the weekend. A bunch of Christian teenagers got together on Saturday night, November 21st, at the tea room of the Pentecostal church. The church's youth group had launched an effort to clean up the town by inviting teens addicted to alcohol into the church. On that night, some of them stood outside the tea room and offered conversation to passers-by, hoping to talk to them about their religion. Jarno Elg, Terry Tervas Honka, Mika Riska, along with the victim and an unnamed teenager, were enjoying a night out on the town. They were all clad in black and stood in contrast to the clean-cut Christian crew. The group of five was loud and unpredictable. Something was unsettling about their presence. They reeked of alcohol by the time they reached the tea room. It was their mission to go there and challenge the young Christians about their beliefs. A storm was brewing as two passionate groups came face to face on the streets of Hovinka. You see, Jarno Elg was a Satanist, a philosophy he had followed for years. He was quick to correct people who assumed he worshipped the devil, as that is not what Satanism is about. Satanism is the philosophy of individual freedom. On the Church of Satan's website, it states that Satan is a symbol rather than a being or God. It says, Satan represents pride, liberty, and individualism qualities often defined as evil by those who worship external deities, who feel there is a war between their minds and emotions. We Satanists are our own gods, and as beneficent deities, we can offer love to those who deserve it and deliver our wrath within reasonable limits upon those who seek to cause us, or that which we cherish, harm. To Satanists, Satan is a symbol. To Satan worshippers, Satan is an entity, their spiritual icon. Bear in mind, the 80s and 90s were the decades of satanic panic. Anyone dressed in black who listened to black metal was assumed to be a follower of Satan and posed a threat to the harmony of society. 
The 1990s also saw the rise of the Norwegian black metal scene. Evidence Locker's episode 31, Black Metal Mayhem, explores the murder of Øystein Euronymous Arseth by Varg Vikernes. The biggest fear was that people who listened to black metal would also resort to violence and murder. A group like the one who visited the tea room at Huvinka's Pentecostal Church on Saturday night, November 21st, 1998, would have been the exact kind of people that parents warned their children about. The confrontation at the tea room was a verbal exchange between Christians and Satanists, and the debate was not physically violent. Comments were thrown around like Christianity is a waste of time and that the only truthful philosophy was the uber-individualism of Satanism. It ended with both groups agreeing to disagree, and the anti-Christians left the grounds of the Pentecostal church. At 11 p.m., Elg and his four friends took a train from Yarvinpa back to his apartment in Torakatu, downtown Huvinka. This was described as a restless neighborhood at the time. Jarno Sebastian Elg was older than the others and saw himself as the leader of the group. He was born in 1975 in Huvinka. He had a brother and a sister, both of whom were rumored to have mental health issues like sex addiction and schizophrenia. Jarno had a rough upbringing and suffered from substance abuse problems from the young age of 10. As a young teen, he attempted suicide on various occasions and received ongoing psychiatric help. He attended the Adolescent Psychiatric Rehabilitation Unit at Kelakowski Hospital throughout his high school years. In 1991, Jarno was also arrested for burning down a church. He was 16 when he set fire to a medieval stone church in Kirkonumi, for which he was charged and sentenced to one year and ten months in a juvenile facility. After his release, he never went back to finish his high school certificate. Throughout most of his teams, he immersed himself in Satanism and loved talking about it and defending his philosophy whenever an opportunity presented itself. He furiously believed in the extreme individualism which Satanism preaches, to the point that you only believe in yourself. He chose to live his life with no moral limits whatsoever. He drank incessantly and distilled his own homebrew. Due to the economic recession in the 90s, making kill you was a common pastime, even though it was illegal. The mixture of sugar yeast and water made a cheap but potent drink. He also had his fair share of drug abuse problems. You see, Jarno Elg followed his own rules and did as he pleased, like harming animals. In October 1998, he tortured his own dog by taping it to the radiator and beating it with a metal pipe. He sat and watched as the dog died a slow and painful death. On Saturday night, November 21st, 1998, Yarno was, as usual, full of energy, out to raise hell with his group of friends. Terry Tervas Honka was six years younger and spent a lot of time with Yarno, hanging on his every word about Satanism. She became a follower of sorts, seeing him as her mentor. Like Yarno, Terry was a heavy drinker. However, where Yarno was dark and broody and sometimes dangerous, everyone who knew Terry said that she was nice that she was always open to conversation, friendly even. Terry came from an average family who lived in Yarvinpa and did not have too many issues growing up. She said in an interview with Finnish crime magazine Alibi that she started drinking in the ninth grade and quickly became addicted. She drank alcohol most days and soon started using amphetamine. After that, she left her parental home and lost touch with her family. She was riddled with her own issues of drug and alcohol abuse and known to self-harm. Like Jarno Elg, Terry also spent some time at the Kelikowski Hospital. In the summer of 1998, she received treatment for mental health problems and was released after a couple of weeks. In the fall, she moved into Jarno's apartment and they spent their days consuming large amounts of alcohol and talking about Satanism. On the night of the 21st of November, 1998, Yarno and Terry spent the evening with three friends, a 16-year-old runaway from Carava, the person whose leg was found at the landfill a couple of days later, as well as Mika Riska, a 21-year-old runaway from Montsala. Mika had met Yarno Elg during therapy sessions at Kelokoski Hospital. Once investigators were able to identify the victim, police officers took to the streets of Huvinka and questioned people, many of whom lived on the fringes of society. A couple of witnesses mentioned that the young man in question was in the company of Jarno Elg and friends on the weekend. The group had also bragged to friends about what they had done. They were proud of their achievement, 
feeling that they had committed the perfect murder. It did not take long before investigators connected the dots. On the 8th of December, 1998, police arrested the four friends in connection with the murder. Jarno Elg and Mika Riska had had some brushes with the law in the past. However, nothing that would have raised a red flag to law enforcement that they were heading towards such a brutal crime. Their crimes were the destruction of property, petty theft, and assault, all due to alcohol abuse. Mika Riska had committed some petty crimes, but nothing violent. Jarno Elg's worst crime was arguably killing his dog, but the incident was not reported by anyone until much later. Terry Tervis Honka and the unnamed boy from Carava did not have any criminal record. After his arrest, police searched Jarno's apartment in Torikatu. They discovered many items relating to satanic practice. The number 666, literature including the beast chapter from the Book of Revelations, skull jewelry and knives. The subject matter of his belongings may have been indicative of the occult or dark arts, but the collection was simply thrown into a closet in his apartment. It could hardly be called a shrine to exhibit his beliefs. Police sealed off the apartment and spent an entire month processing the scene. The victim's DNA was found all over the apartment. There was blood everywhere, on the floor, the walls, and the ceiling. Police had to consider the possibility that there were more victims. All four of the suspects were apathetic about the heinous crime that they were charged with. Elg did not respect the notions of law and order, and was not overly cooperative during questioning. One story that leaked to the media was that Elg laughed throughout his interrogation and delighted in telling police how they treated the victim's body. He found the part where they cut open his torso particularly funny. Director of Investigation, Ari Sorinen, told the media in March 1999 that all four suspects were intelligent young people. That almost made it worse in many people's views, as it brought an element of premeditation to the case. Sure, they may have been terribly drunk, but if they felt justified in their actions, well, that was a scary thought. The people of Finland hoped to find out what happened on the night of the murder, and why. The case was heard in the Huvinka District Court in 1999. When the prosecutor read the indictment, even the most experienced crime journalists had to take a minute to process what they had heard. The prosecutor argued that on Saturday night, the 21st of November, 1998, the prosecutor argued that on Saturday night, the 21st of November, 1998, the four youths accused of the crime, together with the victim, arrived at Jarno Elg's apartment close to midnight. They had been drinking most of the day and carried on consuming copious amounts of kill you. Jarno took them on a musical journey choosing black metal tracks to further color the mood. He set out to educate his guests about his favorite songs, and they all screamed along to the aggressive lyrics. Jarno's favorite album was The Canian Chronicle, an album by Norwegian black metal band Ancient. It explores the story of Cain and Abel, the sons of Adam and Eve. Cain sacrificed his brother, making him the first murderer in the Bible. The Canian Chronicle by Ancient follows the narrative from the fictional Book of Nod, and the role-playing setting, World of Darkness. It explores Cain's life in exile, the sacrifice of his brother, and the defiance of God's angels. As the group of intoxicated friends were listening their way through the Canian Chronicle album, the 23-year-old victim gave his opinion and shared his thoughts. This did not go down well. In fact, the victim's mere presence annoyed Yarno so much, he couldn't handle it. Everything he said or did aggravated the drunken Yarno, who eventually exploded, and punched the victim. Mika and the 16-year-old boy got involved with the fight and proceeded to punch and torture him. On Jarno Elg's instruction, they tied a rivet collar around the victim's neck and made him crawl on all fours like a dog. They took turns urinating on him and also burned him with a hot iron. Jarno punched the victim in the face repeatedly, causing him to drop to the floor and black out. The others picked him up and took him to the couch where he regained consciousness. Bruised, beaten, and tortured. The victim complained and yelled at Yarno, causing the extremely irate host to reach for a pair of scissors and hit him over the head. The victim cried out even louder, and Yarno told the others to bring duct tape. They stuck it onto his mouth to silence him. After a while, a part of the tape came off of his mouth, and the victim begged for mercy. He said he would not tell anyone what had taken place and pleaded with them to let him go the bleeding victim tried to break free and get out of there. 
but his friends restrained him, taping up his hands and his feet. To make sure he didn't speak again, they taped up his entire head. The tape even covered his nose and mouth, and he was unable to breathe. Together with his three associates, Elg tortured the victim. The entire time they were listening to the Canian Chronicle. After a while, they realized that the victim was no longer alive. It was time to start disposing of his corpse. They set out mutilating his body, using scissors to cut off pieces of flesh. Using knives, they removed his heart and intestines as well as the victim's genitals. After they decapitated the body, they played with the taped-up severed head of the victim. During the process, some parts of the body were consumed by the killers. What was left of the victim's body was taken to the bathroom where Yarno, Terry, and Mika cut him up using a saw. The boy from Carava could not take it anymore and left before the victim was sawn up. The next morning, when Yarno and Terry woke up, they could not find the victim's head anywhere. They were all so drunk the night before they had no recollection of where it could be. They could not remember leaving the apartment, so they searched high and low, eventually finding the severed head in a closet. They had a big laugh and continued playing with it. At this point, someone poked the victim's eyes out of their sockets and blew it up using firecrackers. According to the prosecutor, the crime was inspired by Satanism. The motive could be found in the 11 Satanic Rules of the Earth, stated on the Church of Satan's website. Rules 1, 3, and 4 state, 1. Do not give your opinions or advice unless you are asked. 3. When in another's lair, show him respect, or else do not go there. And 4. If a guest in your lair annoys you, treat him cruelly and without mercy. The prosecutor argued that fueled by Satanism, alcohol, and black metal music, the group incited themselves into a spirit of sacrifice. The victim annoyed Yarno in his lair and was treated cruelly and without mercy. The rest of the trial took place behind closed doors. No members of the public or press were allowed inside the courtroom. Because of the ritualistic elements of the crime, police believed the murder and gruesome disposal of the body was influenced by Satanism. The details were so horrendous that the court sealed the case. The media and public will have to wait until 2038 to find out who the victim was and all other information that was not revealed at the indictment. The facts of the case are unspeakable and law enforcement did not want to inspire copycat crimes. Yano Elg was quite taken with the attention of the media during the indictment hearing. He played it up by showing metal horns with his hands and popped up his middle finger whenever a camera was pointed at him. He had long hair and always wore t-shirts with logos of black metal bands on them. Elg became the devil incarnate, and he loved every minute. He smirked and laughed at times, showing no remorse whatsoever. His court appearance was eerily similar to that of Norwegian black metal murderer Varg Vikernes in Oslo in 1994. Jarno Elg received ongoing attention from the public. Many women wrote him letters and wanted to get to know this defiant and dangerous guy who did as he pleased, with no apologies. The media honed in on the satanic elements in the case. They explored the world of Satan worship and black metal influences. In rural Finland, people are more conservative and Christianity is the most practiced religion. The mere mention of Satan worship or Satanism in connection with the Huvinka murders in 1998 sent shivers down residents' spines. So much so, the term Satanism and Satanic worship often became intertwined in the media. They had experts discussing the dangers of Satan during panel discussions on TV shows. The issue polarized the community as all teens who wore black t-shirts and listened to Metallica were seen as at risk of sliding under Satan's spell of evil and violence. Finnish black doom metal band Barathrum frontman Dimino Sova also weighed in on the issue and said that he thought it was unlikely the murder was inspired by Satanism and said the killers were simply some nutcases. Norwegian slayer Fanzine responded by telling Dimino Sova to fuck off and die. An article about the murder said that it's amazing how Satanists are always so full of strength and never forget to remind us that the weak must be weeded out. Yet when someone does actually weed out some weak hypocrite, they are the first to mourn in public to save their precious Satanism from the terrible devil worshippers who ruin the whole name and essence of Satan, which actions that, of course, don't have anything to do with real Satanism. 
Terry Tervis Honka stated that the murder and disposal of the body was not a ritual or a sacrifice. The group had tied up the victim, and when he screamed for help without thinking of the repercussions, they taped his mouth and nose with duct tape. They were extremely drunk and did not notice he was suffocating. Only once he had perished did they realize what had happened. She confirmed that in the drunken chaos after they realized the victim was dead, they got to work to dispose of his body. They took him to the bathroom, intending to dismember him with a saw, essentially using it as a slaughterhouse. She also said that the 16-year-old left before the dismemberment took place. The primary role players were Yarno and Terry, who halfway through dismemberment stopped and passed out because they were so drunk. Terry reiterated that they were all extremely drunk during the dismemberment process. She denied the claims of cannibalism. Mika Riska and the boy from Carava did not sleep at the apartment. The next morning when they woke up, they started drinking again. They left the apartment and walked around the city, trying to figure out what to do next. And that's when they hatched a plan to dispose of the body parts in trash cans throughout the city. When they returned... Yarno Elg continued cutting up the body, while Terry cleaned up the blood. Then they packaged the parts into garbage bags and distributed them in trash cans throughout downtown Huvinka. Their victim was a recluse, so no one noticed that he had vanished. There was no missing persons report, and apart from the group who had killed him, he did not have many, or any, friends. Yarno and Terry kept an eye on the news, and on Tuesday night, at the very end of the show, called Police TV, the last report of the night came in. The presenter, Raya Pelli, said, A gruesome discovery has been made at a garbage disposal site in Huvinka. A citizen dropping off his garbage discovered human remains among the trash. More information next week. Soon after the report, the four friends were arrested. On August 11, 1999, Jarno Elg was sentenced to life in prison. A court-appointed psychologist felt that he, despite being drunk, committed the murder, knowing precisely what was happening. In Finland, a life sentence for someone with no previous criminal convictions meant 12 years. As a separate matter, Jarno Elg was also charged with animal cruelty for torturing and killing his dog. He clearly missed the 10th satanic rule of the earth that states, Do not kill non-human animals unless you are attacked or for your food. In an interview with Jaime magazine, he said that they did not eat any of the body parts and that the cannibalism stories were made up to impress and invoke fear into his friends, who then went on to tell police about it. 17-year-old Terry Joanna Tervis Honka received a sentence of eight years and six months sentence for her involvement in the crime. A psychological evaluation concluded that she was partially insane. On her release in 2003, Terry changed her recognizable last name of Tervis Honka to a more subtle Tukio. She found a job and worked in the parks of the city of Haminlina. Terry stayed out of trouble for a while, but on the 7th of June, 2007, she struck again, killing a man. She was out at a country pub drinking with friends, and when one of her friends aggravated her, she bashed him with a billhook. The friend suffered a 6.5 centimeter deep wound as a result of the attack, which extended almost from ear to ear. He died at the scene. When she was done killing him, Terry called emergency services herself. Her explanation was simply that they had had an argument over drugs. She was drunk and didn't mean to do it. Pretty much a repeat of what happened nine years before. For the second murder, she received ten years in prison. She also changed her surname back to Tervis Honka. In July 2011, Terry escaped from prison, but was apprehended a month later and taken back into custody to serve the remainder of her sentence. While she was in jail, she married a man who had been convicted of killing someone with a samurai sword. Terry Tervisanko was released in 2017, and before long, her name made it into police files yet again, this time for theft and fraud. She falsified prescriptions and smuggled drugs to her husband in prison. For this, she was charged and sentenced to community service. Terry herself has reportedly been clean since 2013. Once her husband came out of prison, they moved to northern Finland, and the couple had a child together. Since she left the South, there have been no reports of crime behind her name. Mika Christian Riska was given two years and eight months in prison for his role in the murder, assault, and violation of a grave. 
Under Finnish criminal law, the punishment for sexual exploitation of the deceased is classified as a violation of the grave. It is believed that Mika was the only one who performed necrophilia with the victim's body while the others watched. He was released once he had served his sentence, and other than being caught for driving under the influence, he has had no additional criminal charges. The 16-year-old anonymous boy from Carava was found innocent as the court concluded he was forced into the situation by his older, more dominant friends. Shortly after his arrest, he was taken to a psychiatric facility for indefinite treatment. In 2011, Jarno Elg was on an excursion and traveling back home to his minimum security prison. He visited a bar and got into a fight, knocking down three people, two customers and a janitor working at the restaurant. He was taken back into custody from the premises and his freedom privileges were revoked. In 2016, Elg was granted parole and today he is a free man. The Court of Appeals stated that he had finished his high school certificate and was employed full-time. His employer routinely gives good feedback and he has not had any other brushes with the law since his release. His exact whereabouts are unknown. If you'd like to read more about this case, have a look at the resources used for this episode in the show notes. Also, visit and like our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash evidence locker podcast to see more about today's case. If you like our podcast, please subscribe in Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening now. This was The Evidence Locker. Thank you for listening. <laughs>